Hello, friends. My name's Chris Woolery. I work at the Mountain Association in Lexington, Kentucky, and I live in Lexington, Kentucky. I use he, her, he, him pronouns, and the Mountain Association serves Appalachian counties in Eastern Kentucky. We'd like to welcome you to the Rural Power Coalition's town hall event called The Time Is Now. This is how. Thank you for checking in via the chat and for joining us today. Uh, would you like, like to just start by giving a brief introduction to the Rural Power Coalition? We're a group of seven place-based organizations representing rural electric cooperative member owners from five of the most polluting electric co-ops in the United States and the most fossil fuel dependent. You'll see on this map that the cooperative network covers a lot of ground and a lot of folks, 40 million people over $40 billion of power purchased, and that each customer of a co-op is a member owner with an ownership stake in the utility and a right to vote and participate in elections for board leadership. Thank you all for pin pinpointing yourselves on this map and for identifying yourselves in the chat. Keep putting those names, locations, and your co-ops into the chat. We're going to move to the next slide and just talk about um, the seven cooperative principles to lift those up. Um, we appreciate the fact that rural electric co-ops are members are made up of an open and voluntary membership. And it's because of the, the that principle and the rest of these principles that we as a coalition are motivated to engage our electric co-ops more vigorously right now. In February, the spokesperson for the NRECA stated that the industry's position on the clean energy transition was, quote, fundamentally, we would want some sort of just and reasonable transition to a zero carbon economy that would deliver affordability and re reliability to the communities we serve. And that's what we as a coalition are trying to provide and discuss today. But there, are, here's the challenge we face. Most of the electric co-ops have an ownership stake in generation cooperative or a power provider that depends highly on fossil fuels. Nine of the 14 most carbon intensive utilities in the country are rural electric co-ops, as you see in this graphic here. And just to put the history of the co-ops into context, the Rural Electrification Act that created most co-ops was an economic stimulus policy to invest in infrastructure, and it changed the course of history in rural communities. Now our country is debating the largest investment in infrastructure in history in rural residents with an ownership stake in electric cooperatives face a fateful question. Please advance the slide to the next one. Thank you. Rural residents and member owners of co-ops face this question. Will we be able to rapidly retire and replace all our fossil fuel assets without going further into debt? And the next slide, you will see on our website and through our materials, the Rural Power Coalition is committed to constructive engagement and we are advancing solutions. The website is at www.ruralpower.us. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass the baton to my friend and colleague, Eric Haddlestead, to share more about our, why our, work, about our work and why we're holding this town hall meeting. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Chris. So to help put this into perspective, the entire rural electric system today has a little over $100 billion of debt associated with the current system. A system that relies on 57,000 megawatts of fossil fuel generation, extracts millions of dollars every day out of rural communities and debt services, and leaves many communities with high energy bills. Some of this debt is associated with the original, original loans for rural electrification. 
meaning that in the 70 year history of rural electrification, debt has continued to increase and costs have continued to go up. But that's always been the reality of rural electrification and the reason why the Rural Electrification Act was needed in the first place. The initial barriers to rural electrification, that is high infrastructure costs, high maintenance costs, and fewer to people to pay for it are still true today. And in some cases, even more true than ever before. Last year, the Rural Power Coalition formed out of groups representing member owners from the most carbon intensive electric cooperatives in the country. The questions we asked during the beginning months of the pandemic were, what do electric cooperatives and their member owners need in this time of crisis? And what can we do to address these needs in the short term and in the long term? The Rural Power Coalition put forth a seven point platform, which was endorsed by 100 organizations from around the country and sought to address the economic, public health and climate emergencies in rural America. Many of those NGO allies are with us now at this town hall meeting, and we thank you all for your depth of commitment to advancing equity in a clean energy transition in rural communities. The boldest part of our platform is a $100 billion investment in the rural electric system that would advance the, that would address these crises by transitioning electric, electric cooperatives to a cleaner, more efficient, equitable, and democratic system. This is an investment that would fundamentally address critical barriers to reducing energy burden in rural America, build rural economies, and secure the clean energy transition for years to come. Our proposal would enable electric co-ops to invest more in rural communities on terms through a mechanism similar to the Paycheck Protection Program to assure that those investments produced immediate benefits. Using the Rural Utility Services existing hardship loan program, Congress can make available $100 billion to rural co-ops that would be forgivable for any electric cooperative that meets outlined conditions that would achieve equity, efficiency, and clean energy. The Rural Power Coalition's proposal for $100 billion in hardship loans with conditions for forgiveness would make the right level of investment and ensure the desired outcomes using a mechanism that has already been proven to work. In 2020, the Paycheck Protection Program made almost a trillion dollars available to small businesses across the country with loans that were forgivable based on these businesses meeting certain conditions. For a fraction of the cost and with a similar mechanism, we can permanently transform the rural electric system in the United States. The Rural Power Coalition and many allies have started critical conversations in Washington with leaders in Congress and the administration. Thanks in part to the work of the Rural Power Coalition, the administration included $10 billion for the electric co-op transition in its proposed American Jobs Plan. Today, even the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association is calling on Congress to offer its members loans with condi conditions for forgiveness based on investments in a zero carbon economy. As negotiations around the infrastructure bill and re reconciliation process proceed, it is critical to include a major investment in the rural electric system and the rural communities that they serve. That's why we are concerned about proposals that are too small. We need a total transformation of the rural electric system to meet our climate goals, reduce energy burden and build rural economies. And the only way that rural electric co-ops can do that now is by either raising rates or taking out more debt. We must remember that the only way rural communities were electrified in the first place was through one of the most significant and successful public financing programs in the country's history. In order to achieve the multitude of goals in the public interest, we must make a major investment in the rural electric system. Put bluntly, if Congress does not make a major investment, the clean energy transition will frankly not happen. It won't happen in rural America. It won't happen in the United States. Leaving rural communities behind will be a climate disaster and it will be a political disaster. We are hopeful, but the need for action is critical. We are seeing the climate emergency manifesting itself across the country much quicker than many may have feared. Farm workers are dying from heat, 
family farmers are being run out of business, and rural residents are having millions of dollars siphoned out of their communities every day to pay for an energy system that is killing them. We do not have time for the false solutions of trying to tack carbon capture and sequestration onto coal plants. We do not have time to build new natural gas plants, only to retire them almost immediately. We do not have time for half measures. Rural America and the entire country need a massive reinvestment. Our leaders in Washington must be bold, and together we are calling on them to invest $100 billion in rural infrastructure and in the future of our communities. For the sake of our communities, our climate, and our democracy, we need rural power now. Thank you. I'll send it back over to Chris. Thanks for that, Eric. And we'll stay here on screen and away from the slideshow and move to our guest panelists. Um, so to begin, I would like to introduce Jim Falk. Um, Jim Falk is a fourth generation family farmer from Swift County, Minnesota, who's a longtime advocate for agriculture and renewable energy. He's made a major strides to run his farm business on wind and solar and has worked to develop local wind projects that would create rural jobs and benefit the local economy. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to this town hall meeting and given me the opportunity to share my personal experience with on-site renewable energy and, uh, and how a major infrastructure investment in rural electric systems can help farmers uh, all throughout our country, rural America in general. So I'm Jim Falk. I'm the fourth generation to operate our family farm in Swift County, Minnesota. I farm with my son, Andrew, who's the fifth generation to work our land. And his young family is now the sixth generation to experience all the joys of growing up on a farm. The Falk farm is about a thousand acres of which 550 are in crop production, 250 in pasture and hay meadow, and the balance in conservation programs and wetlands. I'm a member of CURE, currently serve on the CURE board, and CURE is a partner in the Rural Power Coalition hosting this town hall meeting tonight. In addition to our farming operation, I own and operate a seed cleaning facility with my wife, Karen. We started our seed business, Falk Seed Farm, in 1985, and now it's a key part of our operation. We're a small regional seed company with the majority of our customers farming within a 150 mile radius of our business. Our business is quite unique in that we work with a a very diverse group of farmers who utilize the latest in high-tech uh, genetics and traits, and also farmers that use non-GMO and organic seeds. We promote crop rotations that include small grains. We provide forage and pasture seed, and we also provide seed for prairie, uh, native prairie restoration projects. I've been interested in renewable energy for many years, and in 2005, our family formed an LLC intending to have a 17.5 megawatt wind farm established on our property that we own in Swift County, Minnesota. We attended the annual American Wind Energy Association conferences for many years, making connections with vendors and turbine manufacturers. We participated in several projects, uh, project requests for renewable energy from the transmission providers in our area hoping to be awarded a power purchase agreement, and we were. We entered into the grid connection process in 2006. The process is complicated and cumbersome and very expensive. After spending just under $100,000 and knowing that we were going to be put back into another restudy of a group of projects that included our project, and still there was no guarantee that we would not have to be restudied again, adding even more cost to the project, we pulled out of the connection process in 2009. We were not alone. The process is extremely flawed in my opinion. Many small projects like ours, good projects, simply pulled out of the grid process because they, they, they couldn't sustain it. We'd already completed the state and local permit process and we are permitted for a 17.5 megawatt wind farm, but we could not get through the grid process, the grid connection study timely enough to sign on to that power purchase agreement that had been offered to us. The risk of the added liability of a new study was too much risk. So the reality is that good local renewable energy projects didn't get built because of a flawed system. It's really hard for an independent farmer and rancher to overcome all the obstacles and barriers in front of them as they try to be the owner of a renewable energy system. Just think of what a major economic boost it would be for a depressed local ag economy if the farmer or rancher were actually able to be the owner 
of a renewable energy project or system on their farm or ranch rather than the out of state energy companies. So after being quite frustrated that our project was on hold for several years and still is, we wanted to do our part to offset our carbon footprint and power the majority of the seed cleaning's electrical needs from renewable energy produced on site. In addition to our de desire to reduce our use of fossil fuels, we believe that the cost of power, can, as the cost of power continues to rise, that there should be cost saving for us after the equipment is paid for. In 2016, we installed a 30 kW wind turbine to connect to our three phase power. And in 2017, we installed 33 kW solar system on the seed plant roof that's connected to our single phase power. The tax credits for the wind and the small wind and solar were forecast to be reduced, so we felt we needed to proceed while those credits were still available. We also knew that we could apply for a USDA REAP grant. Even though we did apply for the grant for the, from the USDA's Rural Energy for America program to help fund both projects, our applications were unsuccessful. It seems the demand for the REAP grants far exceed the available funding. We decided to proceed with both projects and because Minnesota has a net metering law, we were able to put both these renewable energy systems uh, in because we have both a three phase and a single phase meter on site. The energy consumption of the seed plant is significant due to the electrical motors needed for processing. The processing, uh, the processing seed and grain, uh, we, we process seed and grain for approximately 10 months of the year with October through May being our peak season. From 2016 to 2019, the average cost of power to run the seed plant was $14,332 per year. I'm using these years for reference as we had a lightning storm that damaged the turbine and we were shut down for several months in 2020. With both our wind and solar systems working, we are currently producing approximately 73.7% of the seed plant's power needs on an annual basis from the renewable energy produced on site. The hybrid system I have works well for me, but certainly everyone's situation is different. And with the reliability of solar and the reduced cost of solar installations, I think there's a lot more interest in solar today. I had the distinct honor of testifying on July 23rd, 2020 in Colin Peterson's Ag Subcommittee on Commodity Exchanges, Energy, and Rural Communities about the importance of on-farm renewable energy. On-farm renewable energy systems are vital tools for US farmers and ranchers as they're and their businesses as they look towards economic and environmental sustainability and to combat climate change. My business is just one example of that. Obviously, the focus of that hearing was more specific to farmers and ranchers and what programs would be available to them. However, our discussion today encompasses a much broader audience, including homeowners and the entire business community. Please understand, we need everyone pulling together if we're going to be able to mitigate the negative effects of climate change. My personal narrative about Falk Seed Farm shows that it's more than just personal economics in the discussion about having more renewable energy supplying our grid. People in general want to be part of the solution, but unfortunately they are discouraged by the process we have today. So we need to be realistic about how we address the policy changes needed politically and how we think about how we think big on funding the infrastructures needed to be successful. The devastating effects of erratic and extreme weather events from our changing climate has a negative economic outcome for all of us in this nation and around the world. We need an agricultural system that can produce enough food to feed a growing world population. These are complicated issues and removing obstacles and barriers that prevent everyday ordinary people from being able to step up and be part of the solution would be a great step forward. However, the call to action is much bigger than individuals and small businesses like mine. We need a national effort focused on a transition to renewable energy in every aspect of our economy. Unfortunately, the energy providers <clears throat> that have had the long-term contracts with the fossil fuel industry have put up even more barriers in the last few years. Many of the electric co-ops have put in a fee structure to offset what they claim is the lost revenue if a member installs a renewable energy system. This seems really hypocritical in that a member who installs more efficient lighting or puts in more efficient appliances will often get rewarded with a rebate rather than being charged an extra fee. That's why the work that's being done by the Rural Power Coalition is so important. Let's be honest, climate change is real. The facts are not disputable. And farmers can be and want to be a big part of the solution along with the general public and progressive businesses. 
Producing renewable energy on site is the most efficient use of that energy. Again, this is not disputable. Local distributed generation systems work and are the most efficient use of our energy on the grid. This is not a partisan discussion. It's an economic data-driven discussion that benefits everyone as we work through the solutions to address climate change. As a farmer who has two renewable energy systems in place, I know the benefits long-term to my operation. It just makes good sense that farmers and ranchers, as well as homeowners and main street businesses are able to produce their own clean energy on site without penalty from their energy provider. We can all be part of the solution by embracing the benefits of renewable energy. A little more cooperation would go a long way to achieving our goal of getting more renewable energy on the grid. A major investment in the rural energy system would help rebuild rural economies and help more farmers and ranchers take advantage of renewable energy. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share my experiences with you today. Thank you, Mr. Falk, for sharing your story and your lived experience. We welcome, to, welcome you to stay on for the rest of the conversation. I'm gonna turn now to Andrea Miller. Andrea Miller is the founding board member for Reclaim Our Vote, executive director for People Demanding Action, founding president for the National Women's Political Caucus of Virginia, founding trial chair of Virginia's Poor People's Campaign, and a member of the Democracy and Governance Working Group of the Virginia Green New Deal. Whew, I hope I got all that right, Andrea. Great to have you with us. Hey, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Rural Howard Holish. And yes, you did a very, very, very good job again. Founding, I've moved on, not, not president of a lot of those organizations. I got them started, turned them over to new people. Um, my work around rural electric cooperatives began really in 2019 because I'm a member owner of Rep Hannock Electric Cooperative in Virginia, which is arguably the second largest electric cooperative in the country with 182,000 member owners. And so I began working with a group called Repower REC when they recruited me to run for board in 2019. So one of the things that is personally very, very important to me is transparency and accountability for both the elections when people run for board and also what is happening with the investments that are being made with member owners. And as Chris mentioned, I chair the Democracy and Governance Working Group for the Virginia Green New Deal. So one of the things that we look at is we look at are our democratic institutions functioning as they should? And in 2019, and even though they have made a number of improvements, there is still a lot of room. When we look at really encouraging rural electric cooperatives to stop investing in cheap fossil fuel and to make the necessary investment for clean energy. The amount of money that we're talking about to retire debt is significant. And that really means that Congress is going to need to make that federal investment, just like they did in the 1930s when they determined that they really wanted to electrify America. If they are serious about having clean energy, then that means we are going to need to see a significant incentive for rural electric cooperatives to move to clean, I always say safe, renewable energy. Now, I live in Virginia, 
and Virginia has undergone some amazing changes in the past three years. One of those changes occurred in the 2020 legislature when Virginia basically decided um, unanimously. And if you've ever spent any time with the Virginia legislature, you know that the two sides generally don't even agree that the sky is up and the earth is down. So for them to unanimously agree that rural electric cooperatives were going to institute a pay as you save program. And on top of that, we're going to hold stakeholder meetings so that their member owners would be able to be a part of the planning process. That was absolutely amazing. So we are currently working through that. And when we look at that, it's very, very important that this federal funding come through for not only REC, but this would give other cooperatives, smaller ones who may not be quite as wealthy, the ability to actually afford to offer a pay as you save program. So in our pays program, if member owners, um, when they do a study, they determine that a new hot water heater, additional insulation, a new HVAC system could save 20% or more on their energy cost. This can now be financed on bill through on bill tariff. And this is just so important for clean energy, for homeowners who would not be able to make these investments themselves. So the pay as you save program right now is the industry standard. We are seeing several cooperatives that offer it. I think it's very important. And we really need the federal government to help. So that's what's at stake now. That's what the Rural Power Coalition is working toward. And we're going to need everybody to go out and work to make this happen. So thank you, Rural Power Coalition. Wow. Thank you so much, Andrea, speaking right directly to my heart. Um, Ms. Miller and Mr. Falk spoke very eloquently to the issues of uh, democracy, equity, transparency, participation, energy efficiency, uh, sustainability, and clean energy transition. And um, we'd like to think those are the things that the Rural Platform Power Coalition's platform and proposals speak to as well. Um, pay as you save as part of the platform and as is a de um, inclusive, transparent, democratic processes. So, you know, as much as I enjoyed that wisdom download, I know that we have 50, 60 other participants on this call right here, uh, many of which are member owners We'd like to invite you into the conversation now to share your interests, your views, your questions, your, your lived experience um, as a co-op member. Um, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand or drop a note into the chat. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, I think that's me. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, webinar or Zoom meeting tonight, it's excellent. I'm, I'm calling from Two Harbors, Minnesota, and we get our um, power from Co-op Light and Power of Two Harbors that is a, a served by Generation Transmission Facility of Great River Energy, or GRE. And I don't know how this fits into the, to the picture, but we, we were part of a number of groups that asked GRE to 
accelerate the retirement of their coal power plant in North Dakota called Coal Creek that they had not planned on shutting down uh, for a long time uh, back in 2019. In 2020, they amazed all of us by announcing that they were going to do just that. They were going to shut down Coal Creek in uh, 2023 and invest, I think it was $1.2 billion in new wind energy and other resources to take the place of that coal plant in Minnesota and surrounding communities. And that happened in May of 2020, and we were ecstatic. They were going to become a 95% carbon-free utility. And um, we were just thrilled at the, at the outcome of that. Then fast forward to last month, a notification came out that said, wait a minute, we're going to <laughs> not do that, and we're going to sell the coal plant to another energy entity called Rainbow, and they're going to run it, and we're going to buy power from it and sell it to our member owners. And I don't know, again, I don't know how this fits into this conversation tonight, but um, this was a really disappointing outcome uh, at this point in time. I think it was pushed in large part by Rainbow Energy uh, seeking to cash in on carbon capture and sequestration subsidy money that may be, may be coming from the federal government. A lot of what ifs there. But I just am interested in hearing other people's comments uh, and how this might fit in with what you're trying to accomplish as far as um, <laughs> having made what we thought was great progress and then falling back again. So I'll stop now and listen for, for ideas and comments. Hey, Michael, this is uh, Eric from Cure. Good to hear from you. Um, so the, uh, I, I think, you know, what Great River Energy do, is doing is really, you know, looking for uh, an answer in the false solution of uh, our carbon capture and sequestration. And that's, you know, really something that we need this uh, federal investment for um, with strong conditions attached to it. So we're avoiding that, um, you know, hopefully in Great River Energy um, before this gets too far down the line, um, but also in other co-ops around the country. So I, I think what we've seen play out with, with Great River Energy um, to me really makes the case for how important this is um, for us to have uh, strong conditions attached to to the investment that we need to make, um, because uh, you know apparently um, they'd like to make investments in natural gas and in carbon capture, and we we don't have time for that. Uh, member owners can't afford that. Um, so that's uh, that, that that's why I would say this conversation that we're having with the Rural Power Coalition around this big investment is so critical. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. I just want to remind participants that um, we are going to have an update on some of the proposals and some calls to action, but we want to continue the conversation a little longer. Um, we have Richard Bloom on deck to make a comment, um, and we've got questions in the Q&A and the chat, and uh, our all-star team is, I see they're answering them right in, in real time. So Richard, if you want to come off mute, thanks. Hi, I'm uh, with the Rural Electric uh, Cooperative here in uh, Indiana and Cambria County in Western Pennsylvania. And I've been working to try to get them to, to um, promote solar a little bit. And they've got some policies which seem to be the opposite to hinder it. Um, they charge a $1,000 uh, interconnection fee and uh, ask for a million dollar liability policy even for very small solar systems. And when I reach out to my local uh, board member, um, I get very little response. Um, he generally doesn't answer emails. And when I did get a hold of him, he said that the CEO um, basically said, oh, that was the best policy and, and that he shouldn't worry about it. Now, uh, Richard, I, I think that's, uh... I think that this is a question that uh, you know so many member owners across the country 
are facing. You know, uh, co-ops have uh, really um, set really stringent um, policies on distributed generation um, and many other things. You know, in in interest of uh, you know protecting their their business model. Um, so you know what what we found best um, to really uh, really address this is I, I think the, the best thing you can do is just start showing up to your your board meeting every month um, and start uh, just uh, uh, asking questions and and let uh, let the board know that uh, you're concerned and you're paying attention to what's what's going on in the boardroom um, you know you have uh, every right as a member owner in a democratic institution to uh, have your concerns uh, heard um, by that board. So I, I would say that that's, uh, that's, that's the first step. And, uh, you know, start talking to um, your other neighbors uh, about, you know, what their experience is as well. Um, I, I would, I would, you know, it, it's easy for, you know, us out in rural electric co-op world to feel really isolated. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of us across the country, as you're seeing tonight, and certainly your neighbors as well, who have, you know, are sharing your same experiences and have some of the same concerns you do. Thanks for your comment and question, Mr. Bloom. Um, and toward the end of the, of the presentation, we will um, present some tools that will allow you to, uh, to research, learn more, and, and consider some next steps. Um, but in the meantime, I wanna encourage folks to continue with questions in the chat and the Q&A, but I want to hand it over to Philip from Renew Missouri. And so I just wanted to get into some of the latest developments um, for where our language is at and what's going on. So, so the bipartisan infrastructure framework proposed by some senators does not assure electric cooperatives can rapidly transition to clean energy without more debt. So similar to what Eric was saying earlier, that right now this really isn't a priority. Uh, this is why we're bringing folks together here to try and get some momentum around this and, and make sure our members of Congress really understand uh, how important it's gonna be to have rural electric cooperatives in any infrastructure plan that we're seeing. So Democrats in the Senate will soon determine through the budget committee how much the agriculture committee can invest in infrastructure over several years. Uh, then the agriculture committee subcommittee on rural development and energy will decide how much to invest in rural electric cooperatives specifically. So even within uh, the budget process, there's a lot of engagement that we can do and can use help with to make sure that this is done in a way that really prioritizes rural interests. And then from that step, we'll be having the majority of the house uh, deciding whether to agree or if they'll need to reconcile. And that's gonna be done within the next 10 weeks. So this is really where the action's stepping up. Next slide, please. So here, uh, this is an actual copy of the discussion draft. We now have bill language that has been finalized. Uh, this is thanks to Representative Cory Bush in my home state of Missouri. So we're very thankful for their support uh, in this effort. So as we've pre previously discussed, here's where we're asking for 100 billion. It would go as part of the uh, federally insured uh, hardship loan program. And while we're here, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that could be done with this program that would be covered so we've really talked about the retirement piece quite a bit. So I just wanna highlight what the reinvestments could look like. So uh, the first point that we're looking at are energy efficiency upgrades. We got to hear a great story already today about pays um, and how that could be used to help folks. So that's something we're really wanting to see as part of this program is the use of energy efficiency and specifically tariffed on bill investments. We also would like to see renewable energy installations that are gonna help reduce utility bills for rate payers should be member owners. We'd also like to see energy storage incentivized to help reduce bills for member owners. We'd also like to see broadband be more accessible, especially for parts of the country where co-ops aren't taking that action and aren't taking uh, the initiative without additional assistance to invest in broadband. And we'd also like to prioritize economic support, training and development for workers and communities that are affected by job losses from the closure of fossil fuel fired power plants. And we'd also like to have an inclusion of bill relief and efficiency investments for all. So it's a lot, we've got a lot in there and a lot of good stuff. So, oh, go back one, thank you. Uh, so this is where we could really use your help. So here we have the Senate Ag Committee. 
they're really going to be the decision makers uh, for this language and what we can get done here, uh, chaired by Senator Sabanow. So if you have any con constituents um, on your lists that are served by any of these senators, or if you yourself are a constituent, it would be really helpful if you could reach out to them in support of, of what we're pushing here. Next, thank you. Um, so similarly, here looking at Tina Smith, um, she is uh, the chair of the Senate Ag Subcommittee on Rural Development and Energy. So really any outreach to Tina Smith or again, majority members of that committee would be very helpful. And on the House side, uh, the Subcommittee on Energy and uh, Credit, all these Democratic members would be great folks to target and, and asking to support Rural Power Coalition and what we're asking for here. Thanks. And back to you, Chris. Thanks, Philip. And so um, we're going to be in touch with uh, more information on some of these calls to action, some of the ways that you can connect. And I want to turn it over to Bree nicely from Appalachian Voices to highlight a few of the high points of those. Hey, y'all. As Chris said, my name is Bree Nisley. I'm the Tennessee Campaign Manager for Appalachian Voices, and I'm super excited to see folks who are here participating today, see some really great names and conversation going on in the chat. So thanks for coming. And Hopefully what you've gathered from this presentation is that we, you know, there's a lot at stake here. If we don't get the level of funding that the Rural Power Coalition is pushing for, there isn't gonna be a rural energy transition in the communities that we, you know, some of us live in and that we know and love. And so it's really important for us to advance this. And, you know, there are a lot of nonprofit groups that are working on this. We need more to join us, but also nonprofit groups alone aren't going to be enough to win the resources that we need for a rural energy transition. We also need member owners, many of you who are on the call to step into your political power. And we've got some ideas um, for some different strategies that you might take. One of those is a, a video campaign that we've been working on. So we have this idea about recording videos that are posted to social media and tagging specific legislators who we want to see them. And we've got a draft that we've been working on that we want to show you now. So I think maybe Renee can pull up the draft and show it to us. Did you know that rural electric cooperatives serve 42 million Americans across 56% of the country's landmass? That includes rural black and brown communities, indigenous nations. And over 90% of federally recognized persistent poverty counties. For 75 years, They've been a critical piece of infrastructure for the communities they serve. And they're currently under serious pressure. If co-ops and rural communities are not adequately supported by the infrastructure bill, millions of Americans could suffer. And the opportunity to transition to renewable energy could be lost. That's why I'm joining the electric co-op member owners, climate justice organizers, and the Rural Power Coalition. The demand that Congress support the rural energy transition by authorizing $100 billion for federally insured hardship loans. Rural Americans have been left out of the clean energy economy for too long. And now is the time to speak up. Find out more at www.ruralpower.us. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, so we want to make more videos like that. And we have a script that you can use to record a video, um, one that's like really scripted. And we have another one that's kind of open. So you can share some of your experiences, like we heard from Mr. Falk and Andrea Miller on the call today. So we will be sending that to you in a follow up email for member owners. And if you're with an organization and you want to be a part of a cool video like that, we'd love to have you involved. Um, and also, if you're a nonprofit organization and you are not a member of the Rural Power Coalition, maybe you've already endorsed our campaign, um, maybe that's something that you want to do, and maybe you just want to get more involved, we're also going to be sending out a Google form with different options uh, for how you can get more involved in the campaign, and that'll be going out in an email after the call. And I actually might be able to go ahead and, yeah, let me just copy and paste that into the chat right now. Um, Yes, I'll put it in the chat right now, but those are the general ways that we're asking folks to get involved uh, currently. And yeah, we'd love to have you on board. So thanks for being here. And I'll pass it back to Chris. Thanks so much, Bree. Um, I want to lift up our social media accounts for you all to also get connected. If you'll see, if we, uh, yeah, thanks for advancing the slide. Basically, you can jump on Twitter or Facebook 
and search for at Rural Power Now and then like or follow us um, for more updates via social media. Please stay connected. Um, and I just want to close um, with those tools that we had mentioned before. Um, you know, the Rural Power Coalition actually grew out of the New Economy Coalition's Rural Electric Cooperative Working Group. And many of the folks on this call, including Bree, Eric, and myself, um, go way back in this work, uh, maybe as far as three, four years. And um, we had previously put together the Rural Electric Cooperative Toolkit. And you can see the URL for that tool toolkit on screen now, electriccooporganizing.org slash toolkit. I'll ask one of my friends to drop it in the chat as well. And so for folks who had those questions, how do we move our co-op? How do we get more involved? Where do we find this information? That is a great starting place. And um, we welcome you all to, to be in touch again through the Google form or even via email um, at info at ruralpower.us. And um, I just wanna wrap it up now. If you'll advance to the final slide, um, just lift up some of the folks that could not join us on the call today um, and some of the organizations that were not represented today, um, one being the Partnership for Southern Equity, um, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, and the Western Organization of Resource Councils. And so we look forward to uh, future engagement. We look forward to hearing from you through the Google form, uh, through tagging us on social media when you get the instructions on the video and the scripts. We'll give you the tags that, you're, that you'll be looking for. And we'll, we're gonna cut up those videos and splice them together and make some products like you just saw and try to get the attention of our decision makers. Um, thanks again, y'all. And I think Bree might have something else to say. Uh, yeah, just a little bit. I saw um, a suggestion that if there are any follow-up comments or questions, we do have eight minutes left. So those of y'all who want to scoot, you got eight minutes of your evening back. Uh, hopefully you've already eaten dinner, but maybe you still got to. So now's the time. But if you do have questions, we're around. So please feel free to put those in the Q&A or into the chat. Oh, okay, it looks like the Google link form worked for Liz. So y'all try that Google link I put out. If it's not working for you, um, just wait for a follow-up and hopefully it will. Hey, Bree, there's some questions in the Q&A if you wanna pull those up and we can read them out loud. I see that. One question from Steven, if Steven's still on, can electric co-ops exist in cities? Uh, I don't see why not. Does anyone have an answer to that? I mean, obviously the rural electric cooperatives that we're talking about were established with federal funding through the Rural Electrification Administration, which has become now the Rural Utility Service. And we're talking about adding some funds to a, a loan program through the RUS again. And you know, municipal areas, highly populated, wouldn't be eligible for that funding. But Holmes is saying, I think Holmes just put this to panelists, yes, there are, there are many electric cooperatives that have started out as rural, but now the cities have grown into their service areas. And that's right, I think there are quite a few co-ops in Georgia that are like that. Um, anyone else want to elaborate on the panel? I'd just like to add briefly that um, municipal utilities are rural utility service borrowers and could be covered, should be covered under these proposals. And um, while they're not directly, um, they're not direct cooperatives, they do have some of those levers um, in which they do have accountability to their constituencies. Um, through elected board members or appointed board members, city council members and the like. And so municipals weren't a part of this uh, conversation today, but certainly could be rural municipals um, in, in small towns or, or bar, our, um, RUS borrowers who have grant, were grandfathered in and then grew to fairly big towns would be eligible. Let's see what else we got in the Q and A here. Um, couple of questions already answered. Oh, did you want to answer this question, Chris? I mean, I guess I Richard already asked this one, huh? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So have you connected with citizens is the other question. I think that's what we're trying to do right now, unless there's a group called citizens <laughs> that's being referenced here. I think there was a reference to citizens climate lobby in the chat. Maybe that's what that was about. Yeah. I don't think citizens climate lobby is a signer to our platform, but we are continuing to do outreach to organizations and we would love to ask for your help in doing some of that. Yeah, John, we see your comment in the chat here and I think a lot of folks can relate to just running into a lot of barriers and difficulty with trying to get their co-ops to move towards cleaner and more efficient energy. So you're among friends. All right, other folks, if you're still hanging out, you have a question or a comment, please feel free to speak up in the Q&A or the chat, raise your hand if you wanna talk. We had a question about storage. Um, Allison, thanks for asking. Um, I don't think we have mentioned much about storage in our platform, but we do have um, beneficial electrification and EV build outs uh, in the list of things that could be invested in and could be forgiven. And EV infrastructure um, is, you know, at its best, a means of storage. And the NRECA, we understand, wants to put EV chargers, two-way EV chargers in houses across America. And so that could be one of the ways in which they could spend some of these investments uh, in which we could build resiliency into our communities by um, creating more demand for EVs, more infrastructure for that, and then building the infrastructure to allow two-way um, electric current and storage through EVs and through other methods. Just real quick, we do have a brief line on energy storage in the bill draft. If it's specifically built within the service area of the co-op and if it reduces utility bills for utility rate payers, then it would, uh, could apply. Thanks, Philip. In general, we have so many opportunities that literally pay for themselves over time. We're focusing on the ones that can actually bring um, savings to rural electric co-op member owners while um, creating economic development and addressing climate change at the same time. Thanks again to the friends and the new names that we see on the call today. Um, well, um, as we close, I will remind you to uh, check, check your email, go ahead and take the survey now, uh, tell us how you'd like to engage, and we look forward to further discussions soon. Thanks and be well, friends.